Of course, few books to quote. <laughs> okay. This way. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the last session of the day. Um, it's our pleasure to have Damien de Fontaine, who will be talking about cardinality estimators. and half of a privacy engineer at Google. Uh, this work is uh, mostly done at ETH with, what, uh, nothing more, okay. Oh. All right, let me start again then for the people on live stream. I'm Damien, I'm half of an engineer uh, at Google and half of a PhD student at ETH. Um, my, uh, this work is done in collaboration with uh, Andreas Lorpiller and David Basin, both at ETH Zurich at the time. And I'm going to talk about cardinality estimators. So before I start, spoiler, here's the spoiler slide. Uh, essentially, the paper shows that uh, the cardinality estimators are a very important data analysis primitives, that they are essentially everywhere in the world of data analysis. Uh, the work shows that the existing ones are very, very identifying. And more interestingly, uh, it shows that you actually can't really make them private unless you give up on some very important aggregation properties they have. Uh, so I try to follow uh, Pat's instructions for talks. So as a result, uh, there is no math in this presentation, uh, and it's only about uh, story and intuition. So I hope you will forgive me for the lack of technical details and uh, tell your friends that they should watch this video because they will understand it. Um, OK, so how, uh, as I said, I'm mostly going to talk about the story and not really the sort of technical details of the paper. Uh, so it started with a team at Google uh, asking me whether they could use hyperloglog -log to store identifiers sort of anonymously. So they asked me this because I'm in the team at Google that actually approves this kind of thing. Right? People come to my team and say, OK, we need to anonymize this thing, or we want to consider this thing anonymous. Can you help us sort of make it happen and approve our plan? So the exact context for the request is not really important for this, for this presentation. But you've got to trust me on this. Hyperloglog -log is really super useful in many data analysis applications. It's essentially everywhere when you want to use when you want to do data analysis at large scale, and you're interested in counting unique things. So, so in, the in the literature, you can find examples like counting IP addresses connecting to a server, counting users who did a specific action on an app, a device is appearing in a certain location, et cetera, et cetera. So I had no idea what this thing was initially. Uh, so essentially, hyperloglog -log is a really cool sketching algorithm that is used to count unique things and store intermediary results. So suppose you have a gigantic uh, set that has many, many people in it, many users, user identifiers. You want to answer the question, how many people are in this set, but how many unique people, right? You want to deduplicate these people. Uh, importantly, you want to be able to split your data sets in like multiple parts, right? Like in 10, in 10 shards. Then compute this independently for each of the shards, and then aggregate all of the sketches you get, all of the intermediary results, to get the final answer. And the final answer must also be deduplicated across shards. So I was like, OK, I have no idea how this uh, will be, but let me look at how hyperloglog -log works and uh, give you an answer. So it didn't really, uh, again, I'm not going to go into the details of how hyperloglog -log works, but trust me on this, it's a really cool algorithm. And if you like, like a beautiful, beautiful algorithm, so this is definitely something to check out. Uh, it, didn't it didn't take really long to figure out that these things, as they are used today in the world, are very, very, very identifying. With commonly used parameters, assuming uh, an, a Bayesian attacker that has an initial suspicion about uh, whether their target is in the data set or not, they can increase their suspicion from, let's say, 10%, which is uh, probably this, this person is not in the data set, to more than 80%. So in the language of differential privacy, like, this is very bad. And that, these numbers are, in the average case, for a sketch containing only uh, 1,000 users. So it can be much, much worse if you're like one of the unlucky users in there. So what do we do, right? So the default uh, strategy for this is you should just protect these sketches as you would raw data. This was an acceptable option to the team, but not a really great one, because you know, when, you, when you have to treat something as raw data in a company like Google, it means a lot of things, right? You have to have you know, encryption, audit logs, uh, very tight ACLs, et cetera, et cetera. So they were asking, OK, can't we just 
anonymize the data instead, right? Can't, can't, we just, can't you just create a fancy version of hyperloglog -log that we can consider anonymous? Uh, and then, you know, uh, relax all of these data protection uh, guarantees. So, okay, what are the requirements of this problem? So they want to approximate user counts, as I was explaining earlier. Uh, they don't, by approximate, I mean, they don't need to have an exact answer, right? If they can have an answer that's, you know, true up to whatever, a few percent in either way, uh, that's fine, that's fine with them, right? Hyperloglog -log in commonly used parameters typically have an error of about two to four percent. So anything in that order of magnitude is, is okay. They really do want to be able to aggregate sketches, a really large number of them, so arbitrarily many sketches, and still deduplicate users. They tell me, okay, this is, you know, large-scale computing, we want this to be fast, we want the sketches to be small, and also we want this to be deterministic. So there, uh, as probably all of you in the room, I post, right? If things are deterministic, I can't use different privacy, because different privacy is all about adding noise to data. So that's a, pro that's, that's a problem. Why do you need this, I ask? They tell me it's actually a requirement of the data processing framework that we use. And it's actually like, I, I'm going to stop on this for a second, because it's actually a very common requirement that I think is understudied in science, in, a, in, a, yeah, in scientific publications. All of these things that allow you to process a large amount of data in a short, like in, you know, in, parallel, in a massively parallel fashion, they use the determinism of intermediary steps to do error checking. And similarly, in a, in a, in a, in a big environment where you, know, you have pipeline that produce data, and you assume that the pipelines can fail and you need to like recompute the data, it's actually a very frequent uh, complaint of teams. They say, well, if we lose the data and we need to recompute it afterwards by rerunning the original pipeline, we don't want the data to change, otherwise it's going to create inconsistency further down in the, in the pipeline, right? So okay, what's, what's this thing that you, that you mentioned anyway? Uh, what, what's the different privacy thing? So as I said, no math, and also you also all have been at the session before, or maybe how many of you have been at the session before on different privacy? Okay, most of you have. Anyway, it's a really cool definition that quantifies the information gain of an attacker. Uh, it assumes that the attacker is very, very strong. I don't see this point emphasized enough uh, when people explain different privacy to people who don't know it yet. It assumes that the attacker knows all of the data, all of the people in your data set, except just one person. Right? So it's a, very strong, it's a very strong attacker. It's a very strong assumption. People like it a lot because it has nice properties, it composes, it satisfies post-processing, it's, it's, it's basically uh, shiny. So when I tell that to the team, uh, the first reaction is, wait, wait a second here. You're assuming that the attacker here knows every single person in the data set except one person. It's very strange because we only want to protect these things for the, for the insider risk situation. Right? We want to protect them against essentially maybe an engineer who, want to do, who wants to do something nefarious. In this context, it's feasible, if an engineer wants to do something nefarious, that they just try to get access to the raw data. Right? We try hard to protect this from happening, but also uh, it's not completely unreasonable to say that somebody who wants to do bad will actually go this route instead. Right? So, and similarly, there's you know, people with access to data just uh, uh, because you know, they need this for debugging or they just have access to raw machines, etc. So in this context, it actually is a bit overly strong to assume that the attacker has access to everybody but one person. Because if that's the case, then they have access to the raw data, it means. And in that case, there's nothing to protect, right? You just lost. So I was like, okay, that's fair. So let me try and consider this problem under weaker assumptions, weaker definitions. So the natural way of proceeding here is to assume that the attacker has some uncertainty. So after a while, I came up with a, a, small, a definition that's a bit weaker. So it's essentially like different privacy, except instead of assuming that the attacker knows everybody but one person, it actually assumes the exact opposite. The attacker knows nothing, nobody in the data set, right? So the, the initial data set is as random as it can be. It's just like entirely generated by a, a random from the attacker's perspective. Uh, it's a very generous assumption, right? Uh, furthermore, for that specific use case, knowing that the user was in the sketch was a sensitive thing. But knowing that the user is not in the sketch is not so bad. So we only look at positive information gain, not negative information gain. Uh, so this definition is not only strictly weaker than differential privacy, but I would assume it's also, I, I, would, I would argue, it's a terrible definition. It's, if, if you give me an algorithm and you say it satisfies this definition, I'm going to look at you like, OK, sure, I'm not convinced that your algorithm is private. But actually, this is perfectly fine, because the result is still that you can't do this. Right? So the weaker the definition is, the stronger the, the algorithm that you get in the end is. Uh, 
Um, so that's interesting. Uh, so what's, what's the fundamental intu intuition behind this? Essentially, what I realized after working on this thing for a while, what I was trying to do is trying to square two completely incompatible requirements. If you want to satisfy the requirements originally, you have to remember people. And if you want to satisfy the privacy requirements, you have to avoid remembering people. And these are fundamentally incompatible. So, okay, let's, let's talk about this about that. So, let's take a sketch, right? One of these intermediary data structures that produced by the algorithm and try to add somebody new to it. Well, first, before doing this, let's try to add somebody that we already added before. In that case, in the deterministic case, the sketch is not allowed to change. Right? Because if you already modified the sketch by adding somebody in there, since the sketch must deduplicate de information, when you add the per same person multiple times, the sketch is not allowed to move. If you add somebody new now, there's two options. Right? Either the sketch changes, because essentially it detects that this is a new person and it changes accordingly, it stores some kind of information. We don't really know what, but that's not important. Either it doesn't change. It turns out both of these options are very bad. If the sketch changes with a high probability, then it gives the attacker a test to figure out whether, the attacker, whether their target is in the sketch or not. Right? They can just take their target, add it to the sketch that they're also targeting, and see if the sketch changes or not. If the sketch doesn't change, well, it's not saying much, but with high probability, it's not saying anything sort of um, uh, absolutely, but with high probability, uh, it means that uh, the person was in the sketch origin or, uh, was already in the sketch, and so it's bad for privacy. Interestingly, if the sketch doesn't change when you add new people to it, it's like the sketch ignores new people coming in, right? And that's bad for accuracy, uh, intuitively, right? And it turns out that if this thing happens with high accuracy, you can show that the accuracy with sorry, if this thing, if, if the sketch stays the same with high probability you can show that the accuracy gets exponentially worse over time. So the, the, the incompatibility here is, is really strong. Right? Even with a very small epsilon, the, the, privacy, the, the accuracy gets exponentially worse as you aggregate sketches. So this was bad news for the team because they really did have to you know, look at the things, uh, look at their sketches as if they were raw data, et cetera. But it was good news for me, right? Because I'm still half of a PhD student and so my job at least for there is uh, do scientific publications. And this sounds like an excellent thing, right? Because I took a real world problem coming from real world requirements and I, you know, I generalized it in a, kind of a nice way uh, by, out, by abstracting what it means to be a cardinality estimator and then proved an interesting impossibility result. <coughs> Unfortunately, when I first came in with this shiny paper to a uh, first conference and submit, uh, essentially the reviewer said, what is, what, is, what is this garbage? You're not even adding noise to the data, right? You're assuming that the algorithm must be deterministic. So sure, you can say, okay, maybe there's some noise coming in from the data itself because you assume that the attacker uh, doesn't know the data originally. That's just one reviewer out of four who sort of picked that up on the paper. But uh, nonetheless, the fact that you have an impossibility result on an algorithm when you're not adding, ev when you're not even adding noise is essentially uh, you know, useless. So I was like, well, you know, real world requirements and stuff, but okay, I guess I'll try and add noise to data. So this was a, a bit harder, but it turns out that the negative result still holds. Essentially, so here the, the intuition is a bit harder to convey. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, go read the paper. Uh, essentially, you do the same reasoning as earlier with uh, comparing the two situations where you're adding somebody new to a sketch or not. Here, the sketch is allowed to change every time. So it's a bit harder to realize sort of why, why this still is true. But you compare this with distribution of sketches. So you add, a, you add a new element to a distribution of sketch and essentially you see what happens. I promise that I wouldn't, uh, you know, uh, hit you with math, so I'm not, I'm not mentioning too much what's happening here. Interestingly, we even try to weaken our already very weak definition of privacy, for example, by adding a delta to the definition or averaging the privacy loss across users, and it still, it's still holds. Like the, the, this particular result that says that you can't have deduplication and privacy is, seems to be like fundamental in a, seems to be seems to hold in a very fundamental way. Uh, we also consider possible risk mitigation strategies, like how do you actually want to protect these sketches in practice? Uh, so it's nice, I have some uh, additional slide about this if you want. Uh, but there's no, essentially there's no silver bullet. So, okay, uh, this uh, finally worked. I got my shiny publication at PETS, and I will now uh, take your questions. Uh, if I have even more time, I'm gonna maybe reiterate the main takeaways. I think the first takeaway is maybe the less interesting from a scientific perspective, because you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, you just, you, you look at something that exists and 
when you look at why it's very identifying, it's actually not that complicated to prove. Like you just, it just looks this way when you look at it uh, uh, like long enough. Um, but it's interesting because it works for, since it's a negative result, it works for all the price, all the cardinality estimators that exist, right? All of the cardinality estimators have bounded accuracy. Uh, so they all, they all have like sort of, a, you know, plus minus 10% um, or something, uh, so which means that they can't satisfy the privacy definition because of that result. Uh, it works even if the adversary is very weak. So essentially you have to pick one of those two things between aggregatability and deduplication or privacy. Thanks so much for listening. I now take your questions. Okay. Questions for Damien. So I, I read your paper uh, before the conference um, because I was worried I was doing cardinality estimation in distributed systems that had privacy requirements and I was worried that this might mean that what I was working on didn't work or couldn't work. But actually what we were doing had an aggregation step, so none of the uh, sketches uh, or the cardinality estimators were ever released individually. They were collected and then they were aggregated in a secure way so you only get the final cardinality. So I'm wondering, in the cases that you were trying to use these things, is that a feasible way around this difficulty? That is, could you, yes, store the uh, sketches in an encrypted way, uh, but then aggregate them and possibly even release the aggregated result because then you wouldn't be able to add one to another. You would just have a single thing that was the thing, the aggregation that you were trying to get in the first place. So. Yes, and that's essentially the strategy that we ended up with, right? What, what I told the team was not, don't use these things at all ever, was use these things, but you know, protect the sketches as if they were raw data. And in practice, that means you know, encrypting them, et cetera. And in a concept where you have, in, a, in, certain, uh, in certain contexts where you have, uh, for example, like different parties who don't trust each other, you can probably use some, I think, which is what you're working on, um, uh, multi-party computation or, or techniques like this can be used. The, here, the concept is really, you want to, release or store all of the sketches at once. And this is where, this is where you can't do this. I, I, I believe that if you, uh, if, you, if, you don't have this, if you don't have this constraint, then clearly that, that doesn't hold. Yeah. Other questions for Damien? I'll throw one. Um, so can you, even if you have to do a little bit of math, can you say uh, a little bit more detail about uh, why adding randomness if it if the sketch is allowed to change each time? Why that still doesn't work? Right. So and can the next speaker set up the la their laptop? Uh, okay. Remember these two uh, these two situations here. Essentially, the math in the in the case where you're actually adding more noise looks exactly the same, except the little clouds here instead of being <coughs> sketches, they're full distribution of sketches. So like the distribution of the the distribution of sketch you would obtain. Uh, via the noisy algorithm. And then the difference between these two sketches is no longer uh, sort of just look at whether the sketches are different or not, but it's actually you, you, you measure this via the, uh, I think we use the uh, earth movers distance between the two distributions. And so if that earth movers distance is, is lower than a certain amount, um, sorry, if that earth lower distance is higher than a certain amount, then, then this fails for the, like the accuracy gets exponentially worse for essentially the same reason. Okay, it's hard, okay. To, convey the no, no, it's hard to convey that particular intuition in, a, in a, just a couple of I was of just thinking, what if the sketch also had a parameter of how many things you attempted to add into it, which would cause the distribution to move every time? R right. But, but then I think we have to okay, wrap yeah. it up. Yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Get the mic. Okay, our next speaker while he gets his computer set up, go, 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 is uh, T. Chanyaswad, who will be talking to us about hypothesis testing. Very. Are we ready on the streaming? Ready? Okay, so our next speaker is T. Chanyaswad, who will be talking to us about hypothesis testing. Oh, all right. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, again. Uh, it's me. Now I have no problem with computer. 
Again, thanks to Samir. <laughs> uh, so now I'll, I'll talk about a work on investigating statistical privacy frameworks from the perspective of hypothesis testing. And this is in collaboration with, again, Chang Chang Lu and Pratik Vital, but also with Chi He and Chi Qing Wang. Um, right. So a little bit of outline of this talk. So I'll start with a little bit of motivation of uh, the privacy framework and also our work. Then I'll talk in details of our uh, main findings and main work, which has to do with leveraging hypothesis testing to guide the choice of privacy parameter in an interpretable manner. So specifically, we want to answer three questions. One, how to set a value of privacy parameter. Two, uh, what if the adversary has auxiliary information, how would that affect this choice of privacy parameter? And three, can the same technique be used to systematically compare different privacy frameworks? Uh, and, and so that's, and then we will summarize at the end. So a little bit of motivation, uh, data, sensitive data, uh, everywhere in, in nowadays, and they can be used in a very useful ways. For example, if you have social or user data, it can be used in network application for optimization and so on. You have health data, it can help with medical diagnosis and so on. Or all these sensors data can be used for IoT application. However, uh, with all these data, the common thing is it can be, because it can be sensitive, uh, you want to be able to protect privacy while enabling these data <laughs> analytics and, and its application. So with this come frameworks of statistical privacy, which is sort of a, a class of frameworks. Uh, a lot of them rely on the perturbation in some ways to protect privacy. So usually what happens is you start with the individual on the left, and then you have a data provider, or in GDPR term, data controller, who collect all these da raw data in the database. Then on the right-hand side, you have data recipients, or uh, more, in, again, in GDPR term, is data processor who wants to build application or do some analytics on this data. So and the inter interface between data provider and the recipients are where the statistical privacy frameworks come in when instead of giving the, ans the actual answer of the query results, it puts some perturbation into it to protect privacy. Uh, among the frameworks, the set of the art and one of the most popular frameworks at the moment is differential privacy, which relies on the notion of neighboring databases as shown on left here, uh, not noted by D and D prime, which differ by only one record here. And differential privacy requires, or in a nutshell, it requires that if the adversary would to look at the output from the mechanism, it should not be able to infer the in individual information in the database. And this is bounded by uh, the, the parameter epsilon. So we, we talk about epsilon a lot, but the, oh well, before that, just give a little bit of example of the classic mechanism in differential privacy, uh, which is the Laplace perturbation mechanism. And this is quite a simple mechanism. You have a raw database, you have a query function you want to answer. Instead of answer the exact query function, you add Laplace noise scale to two parameters. One is, again, the epsilon. And the second is the query sensitivity of the query function, which has a nice semantic meaning, it, as it sounds like. It tells you how much, or, uh, how much your query function would change if you change one of the records. So that's why they call it sensitivity. So sensitivity it has a semantic meaning, so we, we can choose it, or we don't have to choose it, but it, it's a function of the query. However, epsilon, which is the privacy budget, ha has a different challenge of interpretation, of uh, figuring out what it means and how to set it. Uh, there's exist existing work on how to select the appropriate value. Uh, However, well, one class of work relies on economic models, which a lot of times can be complicated and, and difficult to derive the exact value and rely on survey and, and et cetera, as we have seen in the last session. Another part of existing works uh, didn't consider auxiliary information, which we know sometimes can affect how effective the attack would be. So in our work, 
we set three objectives. First, we want to determine the appropriate value of uh, privacy parameter. Second, we want to see if the, ox the effect of auxiliary information would uh, change this value that we want to set. And third, we want to systematically compare the privacy uh, uh, statistical privacy frameworks. And to do that, we choose to uh, well, to that, we choose to use uh, hypothesis testing uh, as a tool. So now I'll get to the first question that we want to answer, which is how to set the value of privacy parameter. And this is the overview of our methodology based on hypothesis testing. You start with the input database. And as usual, we have a differentially or DP, differentially private mechanism, or in short, DP mechanism, which output a value uh, of O. Then we assume we have adversary who observe the output. The adversary then use hypothesis testing as their tool to infer the original database uh, based on the posterior probabilities uh, and, and the knowledge about neighboring databases. Then from that, the adversary can, can detect and, and conclude which database they think the uh, output of the mechanism came from. And from this, we then use this threat model and this, this capability and this model of the adversary to plot the PR relation, precision recall, which I'll explain briefly. Or sometimes we can also summarize it in one number called the F beta. And from this, which are more interpretable, uh, which has a, a more precise meaning. You use that, we can use that to set the privacy parameter. So this is sort of a, a flaw of how our method works. And here it, we drive down into a little bit more detail. So in our analysis, we focus on the Laplace mechanism, uh, partly again, because it was one of the classics mechanisms, but we also show in our paper that our method can be generalized or can be used with other mechanism as well. So in example here, it's a simple binary hypothesis testing where the adversary want to test whether the query result come from database D or D prime. And on the left here is a plot of the distribution of the output from the Laplace mechanism, given that it is from D and D prime. So you can see that you have a green plot and the red plot. The way hypothesis testing works is you want to set a criteria uh, which is a theta here, which is sort of a cutoff, where we know if we observe the output on the right, we will, in, we will conclude that the uh, original database is the red one, which is the D, and if on the left, it's the D prime. So that, that's, that's the key idea. However, to set the theta value, we chose the Neyman Pearson criterion, which uh, there, there are a few reasons for that. One of, first of all, it's thematically uh, uh, meaningful to the adversary because given a false accept rate, it optimized the true detection rate by the adversary, which is exactly what they want to do. And second, if, you, if we set a PR precision recall as a metric, it, we, can, we show in the paper that it actually uh, give the best or the optimal strategy for the adversary to infer. So that's why we picked the, the criterion. And here, the, we just want to give Precision recall uh, the definition. Uh, if for those of, of who, of the, for those of you who are in statistics or in machine learning, it, it's uh, the standard definition in the in the sense or in our setting. I can put it in more like a more like a human language, which is if for adversary, if adversary say that this particular output come from database D, precision tells you how likely they are going to be correct. Uh, let's say if the ninety, the ninety percent correct. Recall means if they try to infer every possible database, how much can they infer? So both of them are bad for a privacy protector, are good for adversary. So now we, oops, sorry, wrong way. <laughs> uh, so now here's the result that we show. Uh, again, because we focus on Laplace mechanism, we can actually analyze, uh, we can actually derive the analytical solution to the precision recall and then we can plot it on here, which, again, the advantage of here over the, the epsilon is precision recall are semantically meaningful. So the graph here show different uh, precision recall curve based on different value of epsilon. And as expected, if you look at the epsilon value, as you increase the value, so you reduce 
the privacy amount of, uh, the privacy protect prediction, the prison recall curve increase uh, in terms of area under the curve uh, toward upward. So it means that as you use higher and higher epsilon, the adversary has a better ability to infer the database. So that, that's as expected. But better yet, because of this curve, because it's semantically meaningful, you can look at the curve and then pick the value epsilon you want to use using this as a guideline. So that, that's a, a key point of, of our work. Uh, in addition, because sometimes people don't like prison recall curve because it's a little hard to summarize in one number. People like to have a one number. So we also use a common statistic, a summary statistic called the F beta score. So uh, for those of you who are sometimes familiar with the imbalance data set when you do machine learning, it's a, it's a generalized version of F1 score where a beta is one for F1. So here is, if you look at F beta score, of, of obviously you lose a little bit of information from the position recall curve, but it gives you a nice statistics here. So if you look at, let's say we focus on beta equals to one is the black line. You can see that as you increase privacy budget, the F beta kind of increase. And F beta again indicates the ability of the adversary to infer the database. So the higher it is, the, the, the the worse the situation becomes for uh, the individual. And more importantly, with because the beta score is, is a score, is a one number, we can build a lookup table that people can refer to and use as a guideline to set epsilon value. For example, here at the top row, it gives the F beta score, and, and on, the, on the left, it's kind of for different beta, beta value. Uh, for example, if you have beta equals to 1 and you want F beta score to be at most 0.9, you know you can use epsilon up to 3.2. So that's a nice lookup table. So that's the first uh, insight of our work. The second question we want to answer is, can we use the same technique to analyze and to figure out whether auxiliary information would affect of choice, the choice of this epsilon? So, so again, the same methodology, and now we add a different part where if the adversary can, can have auxiliary information in the form of prior distribution, correlation across records and time, and uh, we analyze it. So here, the, the, uh, for example, here the first uh, prior informa uh, auxiliary information that we consider is the prior distribution of data. So when that comes into play, the distribution of the output would change. So it would change the threshold that the adversary would pick. And the result is a different uh, PR curve. So it's kind of hard to see how it changes. So I, we put comparison to the previous curve. On the right is the previous one. You can see that the entire curve kind of shift up, which match our intuition that as adversary has more information, it, they are better at inferring the <coughs> original database. <coughs> then we consider different types of auxiliary information, inclu including the dependency and correlation across records. And we plot it out, and again, on the right is the previous plot with the prior uh, relation with prior uh, distribution. If we add record correlation, now it lifts up even more. So more information that the adversary has, the better that they are at inferring database. And the third one is the temporal dynamics across time. Again, it lifts up even more if we add more information to the adversary. And again, comparison, you can see uh, that the PR curve kind of shift up. So this is a takeaway that, that we want to point out that, uh, sorry, as you add more auxiliary information to the, to the, the adversary, it, 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 the situation becomes worse and worse, as we know. So this, again, we use the beta F, uh, F1 score to summarize the statistics, and the curve kind of show that if from the blue up to, well, the dark blue up to the light blue, uh, it, it represents the adversary with more and more auxiliary information. So you can see the situation get worse and worse. And if you want to fix the ability of adversary, you need to use smaller epsilon value. And so that that's concludes the second part of the question we want to answer. The third one, I won't have time to discuss it today, but we want to refer everyone to the paper. We also use the same technique to compare different privacy uh, protection frameworks and, and show how they are uh, comparable in in the semantic sense. So takeaway, summary and takeaway from uh, this presentation, we want to provide useful and interpretable guideline on how to set a privacy parameter in differential privacy using hypothesis testing. 
uh, in more concretely, we want to use a precision recall as uh, a guideline for practitioner to use. And it also has advantage, additional advantage that we found from the work in that it also incorporates auxiliary information in choosing this parameter. And it also can be used to compare state-of-the-art privacy notions uh, from the same perspective. And uh, that concluded. Thank you. Questions for T. All right, I'll start with, uh, I have a couple, but all right, so um, uh, I don't know if, is Tarek in the room? No, anyway, Tarek's somewhere out here. So um, Tarek's paper, uh, Privex, did a similar thing mm -hmm. where in order to choose Epsilon, did an analysis of the precision recall of mm -hmm. the adversary. So um, I guess what is the, uh, what is the uh, advantage of, of your technique over that? Uh, I might need to refer, uh, or I may need. So I, I believe the, one of the main things that, that, that all remain inside that we add is the part about auxiliary information. We also analyze that uh, using, because our formulation has analytical code from, so it, it, you can put all the uh, different types of auxiliary information. So I believe that's the key. Uh, additional insight in terms of techniques, I might I might have to get back to you a little bit later, uh, and I probably have to look into more detail. Cool. So, might yeah. anyone else have another <laughs> question? Yes. Okay. Never mind. Okay. Uh, I just had a question. Um, so you made the lookup table to go from a particular beta statistic towards epsilon. Yep. I wonder if there's an easy way to go backwards and also then incorporate the auxiliary information as well. Yep, actually uh, there is an analytical solution that you can plug in uh, either way. Uh, we, we have it in the paper, so you can uh, look up and then, and then check it as well. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Uh, so sorry if I missed it, uh, is there a guide for for you choosing what level of auxiliary information that you might expect the adversary to have? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? The guide for choosing the level expected. of auxiliary information you expect so the adversary to have. That we we don't actually. So that that actually depends on what it's sort of uh, like a, a background uh, or inform it depends on the designer of how they know the situation. Uh, it, it's sort of a, a question that has to be answered in practice rather than in theory. We do have a metric that compute sort of how much uh, auxiliary information as a ratio, but that, that only turned it into a, a number. But to get that number you, you need in, in an actual use case uh, to, to know uh, what exactly should be the case. So it goes to which laptops? I should. Oh, okay, quick yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so you, I mean, you use the Neyman Pearson yep. hypothesis test, which it, it has maximum power, but is that always going to be uh, kind of the defining characteristic that you care about? Because there might be some suboptimal estimators that are worthwhile for given types of privacy violation. Yeah, we, 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 did, we did look at that, but again, like we, we try to think from the perspective of the adversary that what they want, and, and we, when we formulate it in, again in a semantic, so the keyword here is semantic, uh, we look at that the true detection rate given a fix uh, if it is probably what they want to do. Uh, so that, that's why we, we, we picked it. We, we did explore other things, but there, there's some other challenges which we outline in the paper. So we, uh, I think the, uh, about like some, sometimes about the math and etc. cetera. So uh, we refer to that. Yep. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Okay, our third and final speaker of the session and indeed of the day is uh, Marika Swanberg, who will be talking to us about uh, differentially private and open. Okay, um, thank you. So I'm excited to present our work and I'm about to be a PhD student at BU, but this is stuff that I did when I was an undergrad at Reed College. Um, so the topic is improved differentially private analysis of variance, um, and we're all probably pretty familiar with differential privacy, so I will start off with statistics. Um, 
All right, so say I'm a researcher who's conducting a study with 30 participants, and I want to know if there's a link between um, gene expression and tumor size in cancer patients. Um, so one way we could visualize this data is with a box plot. Um, this shows the median and the 25th and 75th percentiles and just gives you a sense of the distribution. Um, and as a researcher, my question is, is the difference that I'm seeing between these three groups due to random variation or is there an actual dependency between our two variables? Um, and, you know, in this case, they are somewhat different, but you could also argue that they're maybe not different enough to um, give you a conclusion. Um, so we want to know if the overall variance of the database is can be accounted for by within group um, variance. And so statisticians have created a metric for this. Um, so basically it's a ratio of within group of um, variation between groups and within group variation. Um, and here are the specific details. So we typically use the F test. Um, because that's been shown to be optimal in the public setting. Um, and it's a ratio of SSA and SSE. Um, so going back to this data, um, we can compute our F value and we get five. And I should mention that the F statistic is designed to be um, low when there's no correlation or no dependency between the categorical and continuous. Um, data. So the question then is, is, is five high or low? We don't really know. Um, so what we have to do is simulate null data or data where there is no correlation and um, create a reference distribution. So we can see where our data falls on that distribution. Um, so here are six simulations um, with the corresponding F values. Um, and we can do this a bunch of times and get the reference distribution for F under the null hypothesis. Um, and this red line is where the data that we observe falls. Um, so as you can see, it's um, pretty unlikely to, to occur um, if the two variables were uh, independent. So we can formalize this notion with a p-value which is just the area under this curve. And um, it gives us the probability of observing an F value that's as extreme or more extreme, given that our data was generated. Um, it's just random and there's no correlation. Um, yeah, and so as I mentioned, the F test is optimal in the public setting. And this is just generally because it has a high probability of indicating a dependence between these two variables when there is one. And it can do that even with a small data set. Um, and this concept is summarized by statistical power. Um, so generally, the goal of any test statistic is to achieve high power with the caveat that we still need to have a low type 1 error rate. Um, so going back to this example, what if as a researcher, I wanted to keep this data private, but still study whether there's a link between gene expression and tumor size in cancer patients. Um, so enter differential privacy. Um, so we'll consider two databases neighboring if they differ in one row. And here we're not talking about insertions or deletions. We're just talking about um, changes in the values. Um, and then the basically, Differential privacy guarantees that um, the output of our private mechanism will be roughly the same um, for all neighboring databases. And how similar it is depends on our privacy parameter, epsilon. Um, and this has some nice properties. So for example, post-processing allows us to um, just use the private data that, or sorry, to use the, the computation that we already computed privately. And um, yeah, 
And then composition allows us to um, make multiple computations on the same database and um, then compute the privacy loss just by adding the privacy parameters. Um, so another nice abstraction that we will rely on is the Laplace mechanism, already sort of mentioned. But um, so first we compute the sensitivity of our function, which is just how much any one individual can sway the output of, of the function. And then it's been shown that if we add Laplace noise that's scaled to the sensitivity of the function and epsilon, um, that the resulting noisy output is epsilon differentially private. Um, so there's been a lot of work on private hypothesis testing, um, just generally other hypothesis tests besides ANOVA. Um, so there's been some asymptotic analysis. There's been a lot of work on the chi-squared test, which is just slightly different from ANOVA. Um, there's also been other tests, so for binomial data, um, difference of two means, and linear regression, along with a ton of machine learning um, private algorithms. Um, but critically, some of this work is missing aspects that are really critical to, um, to hypothesis testing. So one thing is some of them emit um, accurate p-value computations, which is really important both for usability and um, just, yeah, usability in the field. So if I'm a researcher and want to publish some results, if I don't have a p-value, um, I'm not going to be able to say much about my data. Um, and we also need to see that the p-values are actually valid so that they, um, that they follow a uniform distribution under the null hypothesis. Um, and then also it's really helpful to have a power analysis um, so that we can compare um, the effectiveness of multiple different types of hypothesis, um, sorry, different tests that test the same hypothesis and see which one is most effective in the private setting. Um, so at Reed, um, some of my colleagues a few years ago developed the first private um, F statistic. So they first um, assumed the data was normalized and then they were able to bound the sensitivity of SSE and SSA, the two components of the F statistic. Um, and then they just, they applied Laplace noise to both. Um, and they assume that the epsilon is equally allocated between the two computations. Um, and then they put all this together to get a noisy um, estimate of the F value for that database. Um, but we have a problem, which is what's the reference distribution? We want to um, compute a p-value, but we've added Laplace noise, and so we can't really know what the reference distribution is um, right now. Uh, so there's, you might be tempted to use the um, public distribution or the distribution for the public f-test, um, but that can have some pretty bad consequences. So this just shows, um, this red line shows the, the, the um, reference distribution for the public f-test. And then um, this green line is for epsilon of one, and this orange line is for epsilon of 0.1. So um, as you can see, the smaller the epsilon gets, the more spread out the distribution gets. So if, we're, if our data is out here and we're comparing it to the public version, we might find that our data is significant, but when in reality, if we're using a small epsilon, it's probably not. Um, so they fix this by just simulating the reference distribution um, with null data. And here are the results. So um, they fix an effect size, and on the x-axis we have our varying database size, and then we're checking 
the power on the y-axis, which is just the, um, just the probability that we'll be detecting the effect that's in the data, given the um, database size. Um, so for this green line, for example, epsilon is one, and it takes roughly um, you know, 3,000 data points to, to get full power and detect the effect um, that's in the data. And we can compare that to this red line, which is the, the um, public case. Uh, and it's sort of hard to see in this graphic, but the public test actually does um, require some data to reach full power. It doesn't just start off all the way at full power, but um, yeah, so there's a huge gap between the current, or like what was previously the best um, statistic in the private setting and the public setting. Um, so we wanted to improve that because not all like that all data sets have 3,000 entries. Um, so rather than, um, rather than approximating the F test, we were thinking about maybe just making our own um, hypothesis test. So um, yeah, so we wondered, are there other ways that we can measure this dispersion or the variance within and between the groups? Um, so the F test uses a square difference of means, but we could also use a different metric, like absolute value difference. Um, so that's what we did. We created a new test statistic. Um, we call this the F1. Um, and it has some nice properties. So for one, the SA and SE have lower sensitivity, um, so that helps a little bit in terms of power. Um, but more critically, it has a much higher value. Um, so this means that the noise that we're adding is much smaller relative to the actual true value that we computed, um, and that helps a lot for statistical power. Um, so how do we compute this privately? Again, we use the Laplace mechanism, and here we have a parameter rho that just denotes the allocation of epsilon between these two computations. So we're not assuming that um, we're allocating it evenly between SA and SE. Um, and then we put all that together to get a noisy F1. And we found that the optimal rho is 0.7 for SA and 0.3 for SE, um, and yeah, so now the question is, now that we have this number and this noisy statistic, how do we compute accurate p-values? Um, so again, we can just simulate the reference distribution, but we have a problem, which is that the reference distribution depends on the standard deviation of the database, which is private information. Um, so we need a private estimate for the standard deviation. Um, so one option is that we could allocate some of our epsilon budget to computing a private estimate of sigma, um, but that turns out to be really bad for power. Um, so what we did instead was we used the noisy SE to create an unbiased estimator for um, sigma. Uh, and to be clear, we only compute the noisy SE once. So for, for a given database, we compute noisy SA, a noisy SE, and then use the SE that we already computed to um, get an estimate of sigma. Um, so yeah, so we can just proceed with the simulation now with this estimate. And we checked that we have valid p-values, so that's good. Um, and here's our <coughs> results. So this is, again, a power plot. Um, we again fix the effect size, and um, on the x-axis we're varying the database size, and we're checking to see uh, how likely it is that we actually detect this effect. So this blue line, F2, was the previous um, ANOVA that I showed you, um, and yeah, we need over a thousand data points to detect any effect. Um, and this red line is our test now, and um, 
we found that we need roughly 500 data points to detect that effect. So it's, it's an order of magnitude improvement, essentially. Um, and more interestingly, the F test is optimal in the public setting, but it turns out it's not optimal in the private setting. Um, so I guess in general, we can't assume that what's optimal publicly will be also optimal privately. Um, so we also did some further optimization. Um, going back to our dispersion metric, um, we thought maybe we could choose a different exponent. Um, there's no reason that one should be uh, the best, like maybe 0 0.3 is optimal, but it turns out one is optimal in this case for power. Um, so in conclusion, in the private framework, um, we're not limited to test statistics with closed form reference distributions. Um, we can do simulation and that works just fine. Um, and we have a huge opportunity for power gains in the private setting. Um, these tests really don't perform well on small data bases, but that's a really important area of research. Um, and then again, um, what's you know, what's optimal publicly may not be optimal privately um, in terms of statistics. So basically all statistics is fair game. And um, just to highlight how, um, how easy it is to beat the optimal test in some cases, um, some of my colleagues at Reed gained a whole nother order of magnitude improvement on us, and they'll be presenting at CCS this year. So check them out. And, uh, Thank you for our funding. <laughs>